today. Hey, hey Darth. Darth. Um, I see that Michael is around now, and he's, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Michael, you're a theology master's student? Right, that's true. But you don't, uh, you don't agree with the pre-sup arguments, or you do agree with them now, after uh, hearing Darth run them? Well, I would disagree with him. Okay, go ahead. Sorry to shamelessly bait this conversation. I just want to see you guys. No, that's you. okay. That's fine. It's just I'm I'm game for talking about it. Maybe Michael. Maybe you should just like say what you think pre-sup is because a lot of people get the idea wrong. They think we just assume something and then defend it dogmatically, which is not what we're doing. But just you know, how, maybe how do you see it? Right. So I wouldn't just you know reject all of it. I mean, it it has some virtues to it because I do agree that. When arguing questions of the existence of God, object, objective morality, and so on, you can't really get out of your presuppositions totally. But I don't really think that the, what should you say, that the standard is to have this kind of ethereal, totally objective conversation, because that is impossible. But when I you see, for that example, means. that... Which of it? Uh, your last two sentences. I don't know what that means. Right, so what I tried to say was this, that though it is true that you can't get out of your presuppositions when you're debating with a person who ha holds to another worldview, I don't think that should be the necessary threshold to engage in dialogue with a person of another worldview. Oh, well, we can, we can have common ground, but there's not neutral ground, Okay. We have common ground because we're both made in the image of God. We, we both have foundational mental states that are ordained of God, and we live in the same world that God created us to move and breathe and talk and reason in. So in that sense, we have common ground. But there is no neutral ground because what we're dealing with is an absolute conflict of worldviews. It's, it's a system versus system. And each system is mutually exclusive and contradictory to the other system. So I can have common ground to speak to them, but there's not there's not a there's not a neutral starting point because somebody's worldview is false, and whatever their assertions are that emanate from and depend on their worldview and its foundations do not exist. Okay. Right. So when you do engage, um, as you said, it's not a neutral ground. But Flux, look at Paul. What did St. Paul do when he tried to uh, evangelize the, the pagan Greeks? He didn't go to ask them, from where does your logic derive? From where does your moral views Have derive? Have you not read Acts 17? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. He yeah, tried Acts to 17. Are you aware of the fact that Acts 17 is a passage which is used by Greg Bonson yeah, as an I think exemplar it, of presuppositional reasoning. Yeah, and I think it's wrongly used because he tries to wrongly, engage them on neutral ground. No, it's, Namely, no it, starts, it starts with the absolute triune God. Okay, in Acts 17. And everything else is foolishness. All right, so how does Paul open his speech on the Areopagus? He said, hold on, let me pull it up here. He, he says, men, men of Athens, hold on. First of all, you have to understand that he is not involving himself in a debate, okay? He is in doing street. But it is nonetheless presupp. Okay, let me pull it up here. Okay, now, so it says Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all respects. The word religious there can also be translated uh, um, uh, superstitious. For I was, a while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I found an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. 
Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. He's first establishing that their worldview is utterly foolish. He says, you're just worshiping in ignorance. Right? It says, right, so, but... Hold yeah, on one on. second. Hold on, let me just, I want to pull up another passage that I want to read. Just give me a second. I'll be with you in a second. Right, I'll wait. But let's make sure to get back to okay, this. Let's, okay, let's. Okay, so this. Okay, before I continue with Acts seventeen, here's Paul again, and he says this: For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not flesh, but are divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. Well, what are the fortresses that we're destroying? We are destroying speculations. And every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. God is that which is ultimate and absolute. So when it says we are destroying speculations and every lofty thing, it is anything that somebody presents, either that is not God and deemed to be ultimate or something that exists that doesn't depend upon God. And then Paul says this, we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. That's what he's doing here in, in Acts 7. Great. So let us then return to Acts 17, because as you read from the verse 22, he encounters the Greek and he starts on neutral ground. It says in verse 23. No, sir. No, Can there's I not a neutral... This? There's Can not neutral ground. This. Listen, I let, to, I let you speak I know for that, quite but, a while. Can okay, I yeah, continue? you can speak momentarily, Thanks. but there's not neutral ground because we have. There are two different worldviews. They, you, there can't be neutrality. Yeah, let right. me. Can I? Can I just real quick, like real quick? Um, Christ says you're either for me or against me, right? That'd be a perfect. All right, so if I can continue. So when Paul says in verse 23, for as I walked around and examined your objects of worship, I even found an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship as something unknown, I now, now proclaim to you. So he actually starts by presenting that the- No, he said what you worship, worship in ignorance. Thing. Okay, He's sure. Saying all of your objects of worship or uh, appealing to them as a, 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 an origin source, it's just, it's just ignorance. It's, it's gobbledygook. He's saying that the foundations of their worldview are just simply purely imaginary. You worship in ignorance. When he says to an unknown God... Don't make the mistake that a lot of Christians make to think that that's a, a veiled reference to the triune God of Scripture. It don't People make the mistake that they think, oh, well, let me show you who this real God is that you're worshiping in ignorance. That's not what he's talking about. He's saying whatever your objects of devotion are, you're worshiping them out of complete ignorance. And then he launches into what is the ultimacy, the God who made the world and all things in it. That's called the creator-creation distinction. All right, so when Paul now, said— Now, hold on that... one quick one quick second. got to make a point here. Do you understand that for the most part, they had a belief in pagan deities, right? But they, they believed that these deities emanated from chaos. Are you aware of that? Yes. Okay. So they are not worshiping, they are not acknowledging the in, in their reasoning about states of affairs. They are not acknowledging or, or reasoning from the creator-creation distinction. Okay? So what what whatever powers there are that uh 
control the affairs of men, whether they be pagan deities or laws of nature, right? They are meaningless because they, they, they come from nowhere, nothing. And then Paul immediately contrasts that, but just says, the God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth and does not dwell in temples made with human hands. What Paul is laying down right at their feet, right between their eyes, is the creator-creation distinction. That is something that they did not operate from. All right, so if we could return to the verse uh, before... I've been talking about tangents. the verse. So... Paul is right. hitting them between the eyes with the creator-creation distinction. True or false? Could I, you mean, just finish maybe one sentence is or Paul, two sentences at a point? Is Paul hitting them between the eyes with the creator-creation distinction? What? So what does, uh, when Paul says, I now proclaim to you, what is that referring to? Paul that is, is referring now proclaiming to what you the creator worship as something unknown. No, you're not. You're misconstruing the passage. Paul is simply comment, uh, commenting on what they are mentally devoted to. These junior deities, okay, that their conceptualization and acceptance of these powers to be are all the product of ignorance. Yeah, true. So Paul comes to enlighten them, but you I don't see how you can get out of this when he says something you worshipped, and then you can say unknowingly or something unknown. It's agnostos in Greek. Uh, it can mean both things, I grant that. But he is coming to proclaim that which they worshipped unknowingly or in ignorance. No, you think, you think that he's correcting them that they're they're misconstruing god these were not these were not monotheists no i know they're polytheists i know right they're, they're now 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 if they're polytheists do you know what that means it means that they are atheists on a grand scale because polytheism all right only would exist in the the framework of an atheistic existence. Do you understand? They were worshiping these pagan deities as brute facts. A brute fact is just something that is ex exists without explanation. It just simply is. Okay. Are you familiar added. with Greek mythology? Yes. Right, so you wouldn't say that they extic, uh, existed without reason, right? Well, the, the reason they exist without reason because they say the gods emerge from chaos. Right, yes. In other words, there is no ultimacy of reality that can be identified and accounted for, for from which these demigods actually exist. So Paul is contrasting their devotion to these junior deities okay it's they they are just simply believing this from complete ignorance in other words there is no there is no way to account or attest for them have you read aristotle a little bit right so you know that aristotle He's not, he wasn't talking he wasn't talking to aristotle here Okay, so if I could finish. So you have read some of Aristotle. You know that Aristotle formulated the We're concept We're not discussing of Aristotle. You're changing please. the subject. We're no. talking about the men of please. Athens right now. He says, yes. I observe that you are very religious. And while I was passing through and examined the objects of your worship, what were the objects of their worship? They were the various deities. Can I ask you for some forbearance and long suffering? And let me finish this point, please. I don't want to hear about Aristotle. I want you to focus on the passage. Right. Paul, so, Paul is hitting them between the ideas that their belief, okay, in what they think is the controlling, the, what is controlling things, is complete ignorance. And he contrasts that with God as the ultimacy. This is classic presuppositionalism, sir. Right. So, please, let me just finish. Do you this deny point. that? You, I, I'll have. Let, I'll let you finish each of your points. Please do the same in respect to me. So 
Aristotle wrote 300 years before Paul arrived in Athens. We're not discussing Aristotle, sir. We're talking about, we are talking about the men of Athens. Of creation. Okay, no, listen to me, sir. I'm not going to tolerate this. You are changing the subject, okay? Now, there's, there's a presuppositional problem even with Aristotle's God, but that's not what is under discussion here. What is under discussion are the men of Athens and the gods that they, they were devoted to. And the Aristotelian concept. No, where did you get that from? Where did you get? Listen, one more time. You, you are interjecting something that is not here in the text. He is discussing the men of Athens and the various deities the demigods that they were devote, devoted to and including one, an altar to an unknown God. The unknown God there is not referencing simply an unknown, all-powerful, all-knowing, absolute God. This is just simply an unknown junior deity. All right, this is what he's referring to. Now, are you interested in having a conversation or dialogue about this? I am interested, but you keep on wanting to change the subject onto discussing Aristotle's view from 300 years earlier rather than discussing the text in Acts 17. Paul is challenging their belief in the ruling powers of the deities, which Paul says this is all ignorance. Right. So if we want to have this dialogue, could we just okay, re- you, you listen to me? To Stop it saying it now. Do you want we're gonna stick to the text or we're gonna move on to somebody else? All right? Now he is challenging their belief and devotion to various deities, including one deity that they just have a statue to, and well, we don't know who he is. Then Paul says to him, all of these gods, basically, that you're worshiping, it's all the product of just gobbledygook, ignorance. This is what he's saying. It's clear from the text. And then he, then he makes a contradistinction. The God who made the world, he's referring to God as the ultimacy. The pagan gods were not absolute gods. Are you aware of that? They were not ultimacies. We also agree that the Book of Acts mentioned the philosophical school of the Epicureans and the Stoics, right? Right now, we're talking about the men of Athens. The yeah, bottom line here the is, the bottom line here, Athens. listen, they're not talking about the triune God. And any no, okay. such God does not, does not exist. So Paul is delivering a one-two punch blow in presuppositional form. He's saying, hey, listen, you know all these gods that you worship? You have all these altars over here, okay? And you even have a, another god. You don't even know what his, what, what his name is. And he says, you're all believing in, in this from complete gobbledygook, ignorance. He says, there is one god who is the creator of all things. He is, he is making a contradistinction between their non-creator-creator creator distinction with the creator-creator creator distinction when he says the God who made the world and all things in it, since he is the Lord of heaven and earth. Okay? These, these, these men of Athens were, were not monotheists who believed in a creator-creator creator distinction. Nor did they believe that that God was absolute. Even Aristotle's God is not an absolute God. Are you aware of that? No, that's wrong. That's wrong. No, that's simply a mistake. No, 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 it isn't. It isn't wrong. Is because did Aristotle believe that there was an eternal state of abstract objects? No, that would be Platonism. Okay, excuse me. I made. I made that. 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 You are correct. Okay. But, so, but did. Also- did I mean, did as a brother the, in Christ, the, could you please just allow me to? have the respect of being allowed to yeah as long as you don't change the subject let's get back to the no, text right, yes great so just in the very next chapter right or is it in get the same to the, chapter? yeah okay oh please come on come on go ahead long suffering respect please patience go ahead i'm yeah. going to mute so you the, if you, you don't continue so there is a mention of stoics in the text right we agree with that what verse 
Um, I can't remember, but you you know, like it's okay. So we're sticking with Act Seventeen right now. We're dealing with the fact that they do not; they are not holding to the creator creator distinction. That's clear from the text. Okay. Yeah. So, do you remember the mention of the Stoics and the Epicureans who came to debate uh, to debate Paul? Yeah, I'm 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 familiar with that. Yeah, but right, right now so we're talking you know about Act Seven. Stoic, right now we're Stoic, right now we're talking yeah. about Act Seventeen. Change the subject again, and I'm going to mute you. Stick to the text. Right. So, okay. Is Paul it was addressing nice people trying to talk who, some sense with you? But okay, this yeah, is just yeah. Mean. See you later. Yeah. Don't let the door hit you on the way out. Bye bye. Yeah, he wants. See, he has this this attitude that that Paul is trying to find neutral ground, okay, and say like, "Hey guys, you know what? We all believe the same foundational thing, but you just got it a little bit messed up." And and here's the correct way of to look at the thing that we ultimately agree upon. No, that's not what he was saying. He's saying is, "You worship all these gods. You got you got statues to all these gods, including one god you don't even know. You don't even know his name." He said, and he says to him, all of that is just simply ignorance. It's complete made-up gobbledygook. 